So um, welcome everyone. We are, um, my name is Louise Missel. I am the project manager on the Climate Smart Landscape Conservation Planning and Design Project. And we are going to be talking today about the Transboundary Madrean Watershed Pilot Area. So thank you all for joining us. There's been lots of interest in this pilot area and we're looking forward to uh, working with all of you to develop the conservation design for this area. So a couple of logistical notes. Um, we have with us um, several people that I'll introduce. Um, I will be pausing for questions and um, we have slides in Spanish and English so I will go ahead and proceed um, in English if um, we have a need to pause and do some simultaneous interpretation we will um, please raise your hand if you're having trouble and we'll pause and check in with folks um, to see if we need to do a little more uh, interpretation but hopefully we'll be able to move along in English. Um, so here is the conservation design team. Um, I introduced myself. I'm, I'm um, project lead and also work with Sky Island Alliance as a conservation director based out of Tucson. Uh, we have with us on the, on the line here the Desert LTC Science and General Coordinators, Amy Roberson and Genevieve Johnson, and Erin Wilkerson, who's working on the BLM side of the project. And I'm excited to introduce Maureen Carell to all of you. And some of you have probably met her um, at the recent meeting in Alpine, but she has come on in the landscape ecologist capacity and we're very happy to have her on the team. And we have Tony Robertson and Colleen Whitaker from uh, Southwest Decision Resources on the facilitation collaborative process side. And Sergio Avila with the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum on also the facilitation collaboration side. So I want to uh, let Juan Carlos and Peter introduce themselves. They're part of your pilot area guiding team and we're nominators for these two pilot areas that have been combined into the Transboundary Madrean Watershed. Oh, hello, um, I'm gonna get started. My name is Juan Carlos Bravo. I am the representative in Mexico of the um, organization Wildlands Network, we do uh, large landscape conservation focused on connectivity for large carnivores throughout North America. And um, I um, coordinated the nomination for this area in the hopes of bringing together several groups to, to start planning for the region. And while doing so, I learned that, that Peter was coordinating a similar effort for the, for the San Pedro watershed. So it made better sense to collaborate and and we've we found a way to do so in the in the process and now we're both helping each other in the um guiding team that you learn a little bit more about and i'm uh, peter Els. i'm the chair of the landowner based and the all volunteer lower san pedro watershed alliance we're associated with the Cascabel Conservation Association, um, the local Autobahn chapters and other conservation groups active along the San Pedro. And our group is now making this transition from being promoters and nominators for including our watershed in the larger pilot area to acting as a liaison between conservation minded land managers and the scientific community. So feel free to contact me if uh, you have any questions about that particular perspective. All right, thank you. And Sergio is not with us today. He's in Hawaii, but <laughs> no, we'll be seeing Sergio, him in future Aloha, meetings. Sergio is here. Oh, he is here. I'm here. And please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, this is Sergio Avila. I'm a conservation scientist with the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. Um, I have the pleasure to collaborate with the the LCC for a number of years now and uh, trying to bridge uh, logistically and in, in, in other ways our knowledge, uh, sharing knowledge between Mexico and the U.S. for this planning effort and um, thank you. Great, glad you could join us. Um, so I have this note here of other folks to be determined. Um, we started talking within these initial uh, guiding team members about getting broader representation on this guiding team, particularly from 
agencies working in this region um, and other important groups um, to get a little more diverse uh, guiding team. So uh, more to come on that later in the webinar. So today we're going to talk about, I'll give you a little overview of the reminder of the conservation design process, where we've been and what's coming, um, and then talk about proposed outcomes and measures of success for this particular pilot in addition to the whole conservation design process. And then talk a little bit about um, why the Transboundary Madrean Watersheds was selected. And really importantly, get into some more details around how this work and your engagement can benefit you as a partner and collaborator and how you can engage with some next steps. So just as a reminder, this landscape conservation planning and design effort is really around determining, uh, starting determining design priorities. So thinking about stressors to priority ecosystems and species conservation targets that we want to focus on within the desert LCC and this Madrean, uh, transboundary Madrean watersheds pilot area. And then doing spatial work around understanding where those ecosystems and resources are and where species are in the area. And adding to that modeled projected impacts from climate change and other threats that we can then feed into adaptation planning to develop conservation actions collaboratively. And really importantly, building on existing work, such as the BLM's rapid eco ecological assessments that have already been done in this region. So coming out of, or going into um, um, this effort is the Conservation Planning Atlas, an online tool, which is where we'll be um, placing assessments and inventories, mapping ongoing efforts. And this will be an important collaboration tool for partners helping us understand where conservation actions are most needed and sharing data and products from this effort. So the desert LTC has already identified streams, springs, grasslands, and shrublands as priority ecosystems to focus on. And over the coming months, we'll be looking at potential species vulnerable to climate change in this pilot area that we want to focus on as well. And so, again, working toward these common goals, objectives, and measures of success. So over the past year, we've been working to develop what we're calling the context for conservation design through workshops and information gathering. Many of you participated in workshops in Tucson and Aguas Calientes last year. Um, these were really focused on bringing partners together to start understanding shared goals, potential strategies, and adaptation actions and start thinking about um, which pilot areas we would really want to work in. So um, out of that came this idea of combining the San Pedro proposal and the Transboundary Madrean proposal. And this is a photo of the group that was in Aguas Calientes. Um, some of you are in this photo. <laughs> it was a great meeting last fall um, working on these issues. So in addition to these uh, workshops in, in 2015, we've got an ongoing stakeholder assessment project that many of you have probably engaged with at this point, and we'll be stepping that down to look specifically at the Madrean pilot area as we move forward with that. And then really importantly, we recruited pilot area nominations and selected three. The Transboundary Madrean Watershed, which we're talking about today, and also so you know these are moving in parallel here, the Big Bend Rio Bravo, Lower Rio Conchos area, and the Eastern Mojave. And we just had our Big Bend call earlier this morning. So, so I will um, pass this to Juan Carlos and Peter to say a little bit about the context of this um, pilot area that we'll be working in. Yes, thank you, Luis. Um, first of all, I'd like to know if there are any questions, and particularly I'll ask our uh, Spanish speaking um, participants. Si hay alguna pregunta de la presentación, algo que se hayan, eh, que, que quisieran más detalle de, de lo que dijo Luis, es un buen momento para levantar su mano. No, hasta ahorita todo claro. It seems like 
I can't see any questions. I don't know if you with moderator privileges can see any. I don't see any hands raised, so I think we're okay. Okay, cool. And we are ready to move on. So what you're all seeing now is a, a map of the trans Watershed Pilot Area within the context of the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And this area was uh, originally intended to be um, the Sky Islands region in which there's already many collaborations. But at the same time while doing this, we realized that um, that there was a similar effort in the, um, the grasslands of Chihuahua to to nominate uh, a pilot area. And we thought, well, the whole point of the DLCC is to expand collaboration and um, bring in partners that are probably not working together right now. So why miss this opportunity? And, and let's, let's try and see if we can um, create a merger of the the partnerships that already exist in the in the grasslands of Chihuahua and the partnerships that already exist for the Skylands region, and so this is what that looks like, and somewhat delimited by the the same geography of the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Um, if you could show the next slide, please. Oh. So this is it for the map. <laughs> yeah. This is the map. I think this was the questions that we should ask. Uh, a lot of it is based on basins, the the uh, the limits of the of the area was determined um con taking into consideration the watersheds that that somehow present um distinct uh, habitats for, for species. Mm -hmm. Can we see more than the map, Luis, you think, than following slides? Yeah, so um, the next section is is about the proposed outcomes and measures of success. Mm -hmm. I can't see it. I'm there. Okay. Okay. Peter, did you want to add anything on the map? Well, uh, uh, the only thing I would add is that uh, the partners that that have been working together in the San Pedro recognize that the San Pedro watershed is at a crossroads and um, there are important decisions, very significant decisions being made there every year and we welcome the opportunity to uh, form a, a multi-layered database, integrated database to help inform these decisions and uh, we're grateful that that this watershed was included in a much larger context. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna talk just a, a little bit here about um, outcomes and measures of success for the conservation design process. And then I'll let Juan Carlos and Peter talk to you a bit more about specific ones for this pilot area. And I'll just note that these are coming out of um, a combination of output from the conservation design workshops that we convened last year in Tucson and Aguas Calientes, and also a meeting held in Alpine earlier this year with the various desert LCC um, working groups, science working group, um, critical management question teams. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time in that meeting talking through what, what does success look like for this project. And so really um, overarching important success um, piece here is that partners are working collaboratively to develop this plan, which will then help them secure additional resources to implement conservation projects. And obviously, the plan itself is also a resource to help think about implementing conservation projects. And in that vein, you know, we really, um, partners talked about really wanting to have a model have a that model of partnerships that continues beyond the end of this LCC, uh, desert LCC conservation design process. So we're building this new way of doing work together. And um, folks have brought up this um, idea of, of this process really being able to provide a forum for resolution of broad scale issues like treat, treatment of invasive 
species that are difficult or cross boundary, um, they're big issues that this process can help address. And then really importantly, both for um, the overall process and for the pilot area, um, folks have talked a lot about wanting to establish a baseline for success so that um, we understand where people are at now and can really measure how we're advancing conservation on the ground. And now I'll pass it back to Juan Carlos to chat okay. about um, measures of success that were specifically talked about from folks working within this pilot area. Yes, thank you, Luis. So one of the things that, that we decided we needed, and um, um, we, we brought this up in a specific pre-meeting for the area in Alpine, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's exclusive to our area, um, it was the need to, first of all, determine a, a baseline for anything that we want to, want to achieve. And so through the baseline, we would have to somehow uh, come to certain agreements on what we need to measure and how to measure uh, things like wildlife corridors and number of springs, those kinds of things throughout the whole area so that we can then say, okay, our plan is to get us on. And so we decided we would we a bit of measuring success was to keep in mind that some of the, the progress made would be. Yes? We're getting, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting feedback. feedback. Okay. Um, um, is now in silent mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, Juan Carlos, please try pressing star six and let's see if that helps with the feedback. That will unmute your line. Star six. I don't know what's going on, it's not working today. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, one Carlos. Are you there, one Carlos? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Um, we can hear you. Keep speaking. And okay. We'll okay. So just briefly, besides getting a baseline, we also decided that we were going to measure success in two different fronts. One of them being uh, how effective we are improving our are ways to collaborate and communicate, um, things such as agreeing on uh, w what the metrics are for what we do. We can come up with um, um, GIS databases that are consistent throughout the landscape. Uh, those kinds of things are one of the success things we, we will be measuring. And another one has more to do with on the ground success and effectively how many springs are we protecting, how many corridors for wildlife remain open, those kinds of things. Um, that Those were the specific things we, we discussed for the, for the area. Um, we, of course, didn't go into much detail because that's, that's going to be the exercise for the, the whole partnership. All, all we did at this point was was um, frame how we're going to talk about success. Anything else, okay. Peter, you think? Uh, yeah, no, uh, that, that covers it pretty well, Juan Carlos. I wasn't at the Alpine meetings, but uh, you've, covered, uh, you've covered all these measures pretty well. Okay, then. Um, I think we can move on to the. Are there any questions yet at this point? Or si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, también la puede hacer en español. Uh, Larry, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. 
Looks like your hand is raised. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if these questions were still in are these been uh, formally kind of approved and agreed upon, or are they still in draft form? The success metrics that we're talking through. Yeah. I would say they're draft. they're still in draft form. So these were initially developed, um, uh, as we said, through these two workshops and then the meeting, and they're certainly, as Juan Carlos said, open for further addition as we move through this pilot area process, and we certainly want to be working with um, the Desert LCC working groups and steering committee to review those things and, and get everyone on the same page about how we're really going to measure success. Great. Well, I, you know, when you figure out a, a process for doing this, I'm happy to contribute to it. And I have a brief question for Juan Carlos Bravo, which you will really appreciate, and that is, what is your theory of change for this process? <laughs> That's that's an interesting one. Um, the, the theory of change here is that um, as a society, we seldomly plan enough ahead and consider very little uh, complex processes, complex landscapes, com complex diversities of stakeholders, and we need to improve our ways of doing that if we're going to solve complex issues that, that affect uh, large parts of the planet. So um, what we're doing effectively is, is, and I like to think of it as an exploration, because even if, if everything fails in, in terms of this plan, we will have improved our capacity to, to plan among diverse stakeholders in two different countries, four different states. Uh, we will have, uh, as individuals, a, a broader sense of, of how to tackle many of these issues. And so, uh, also, ideally, we will have achieved some uh, partial success on the ground in, in protecting some of the things that, if left to individual or very local management, uh, would, would suffer just from this uh, lack of vision. That's that's the way I, I I perceive a process like this moving forward and and achieving something. And there could be others. Uh, if anybody else wants to weigh in on this, uh, I don't have to be the only one. <laughs> that's very good, Juan Carlos. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the good question and the great answer. Um, let's go ahead and move on to talk. Uh, I'll just talk really briefly about why this. This area was selected. You all are pretty familiar with it, and we're actually um, are talking as we talk through this, covering some of the important features of why the Desert LCC Steering Committee chose to move forward with this Transboundary Madrean Watersheds Pilot Area. Um, so it really presents this learning opportunity for working binationally on on this type of large landscape planning. And there's lots of great active pre-existing partnerships in the area. Oops, sorry. Um, and um, there's lots of different partners working in this area, which provides, going back to what Juan Carlos was saying about very local work feeding up into this bigger vision, you know, it provides a lot of opportunity for people taking different conservation action and um, for learning about different ways to approach uh, conservation efforts. And this is a look at our initial partner. I uh, think Peter was going to talk a bit about this slide, so I'll pass it over to him. Well, here's the logos for most of the organizations that are involved at this point. If you don't see the logo of your organization, uh, please send it um, for future documents. Um, the more science-based groups we have involved, the more credible our findings will be. And um, I think the, the better our results will be also. Uh, the more, the more groups that we can have involved. Yeah, one other thing about uh, now that you brought up uh, the, uh, the aspect of credibility through science is that um, this is one way in which we're exploring um, large landscape collaboration. And it's a way that's focused on acknowledging the, the value of science of presenting um, um, a vision of a solution 
that strives to be very, very objective and, and transcend political and cultural barriers. So we want to keep that focus there because we all know there are certain political aspects in our, each of our local areas that are that could be challenging. And so what we want to present is this overall framework with a scientific vision that can ideally guide in finding local solutions. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that there, you know, you see a real wide diversity here again of, of conservation organizations, agencies managing land, federal U.S. agencies managing land, U.S. agencies managing wildlife, um, Mexican um, non-governmental entities, local government entities, so really nice broad um, representation. Um, let's see, so I see, um, we'll just pause for a minute for questions, and I see um, Trisha here that has a question. She says, what if the locals don't want the vision? <laughs> so I will um, start answering that by saying that I think um, part of what we're trying to uh, explain here and share with you is how we really are intending to engage partners within the pilot area in a way that we're hoping to build a shared vision with folks um, working in the region, living in the region. And um, our, our certainly our, one of our goals is that the people working with us on this do want the vision. I don't, I don't know if that gets at your question, Tricia, or if Juan Carlos or Peter, you want to add anything there? Well, there's all sorts of ways that decisions get made at the local level. And, uh, you know, our organization and Cascabel Conservation Association and uh, a lot of other conservation groups understand that there's public comment periods and there's hearings and there's uh, all sorts of, for all the way up to court action, there's forums for drawing in uh, the, the science base uh, in the decision-making process. So um, it's never, it never comes down to being simply the locals don't want it. It's usually contested and worked out through public processes, and the more science you have available to inform those, those processes, the better. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, what the LCC is really doing here is providing those tools and the science and the forum to really help people who are taking actions on their own be able to do that in an effective way. So I think that's really an important um, piece of this effort. I see um, Pani's hand up. Did you want to unmute yourself and say something, Pani? Yeah, I was just going to add to what you already just said, Louise, that this is about helping all the existing organizations and agencies better align their efforts for greater impact. Um, so it's not necessarily creating new visions beyond what they would already be wanting to move towards. All right. Um, so let's talk, since we're going this way anyways, a little bit more about how this cross-boundary conservation design can really benefit all of you as partners and collaborators. Um, let's see. So, um, and I think I was going to pass this to Juan Carlos to cover these slides. Does that sound right? Or Tani? <laughs> well, Tani, do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about the benefits and potential outcomes? Yeah, okay. So um, we, we had conversation at both workshops as well as um, a workshop um, in Alpine with the, all of the uh, LCC teams, uh, really to try to start um, looking at both the outcomes and measures of success um, so that we could be designing the whole process and doing everything towards that end of having really concrete, achievable outcomes that would have, you know, results on the land. Um, so this is both the measures of success and these potential outcomes are kind of a first cut on what people uh, thought about these outcomes, which has been really helpful so far. So obviously, 
uh, increasing the technical interaction with partners across the border on key conservation issues since they crossed the border and just uh, jurisdictions in general. Um, la landscape scale monitoring, data compatibility, sharing, figuring out how to, how to um, really make progress on the whole monitoring across boundaries, broad scale monitoring um, need. Uh, interaction between universities, both within each country and across the border. Next slide. Could you move to the next slide, Louise? Uh oh, is it not working? There we go. Oh, okay. And uh, obviously building a strong case for funding conservation projects because this is larger scale, more organizations and agencies, um, large landscape, um, more competitive for funding, and hopefully this can provide the collective sense of all of the elements as well as language that would help um, all of you be able to um, su succeed at getting more funding. And finally, um, providing and sharing tools across uh, partners. Okay. And there are, there are no doubt many others, but these are the ones that we decided to share. All right, thank you. Let's see, I think we have a little pause here. So I saw um, for some questions, I saw James had his hand up. Did you want to ask a question, James? Sure. Hi, this is James. Um, so just kind of adding on to Tricia's question, um, in dealing with folks who really are not interested in this or adamantly opposed, um, I'm just thinking about are there plans for helping partner organizations with stakeholder engagement? And it's easy to engage people who are already on board. <clears throat> um, but helping them to to address groups or stakeholders who are facing kind of bottom line questions like, you know, I need to have as many, they think, I need to have as many cattle on my land as possible in order to make money. And so they're real world questions that, you know, we need to address and can address. Um, but have you guys thought about that? Um, yeah, you bring up a really good point. Um, we have talked recently as we've talked, I mean, this, this engaging communities in an effective way has been an ongoing conversation throughout developing this process. And um, we've been talking recently actually about exactly um, that issue in how we develop um, the process for the rest of the year. And I think this idea of providing um, outreach tools and, and working with the partners in the Madrean to understand, you know, where the where the um, pinch points are or the rough spots in terms of how we actually um, talk with people on the ground will be very helpful. Tony, did you want to say anything more about this from the perspective of the stakeholder assessment? Yeah, we will, we are doing a stakeholder assessment at the same time we uh, has a, a kind of an ongoing survey across the visit LCC to get a sense of who's doing what, where, and with whom. Um, and then we're starting to go into greater depth within the pilot areas um, because we really want to have a, um, you know, work where people are and also work with existing collaborative groups. So, um, yeah, and if you have some more thoughts as we develop that, um, we're happy to talk to you um, separately. Yeah, I think that's a good um, thought and issue to definitely have in our in our minds as we move forward. I think um, uh, a oh, thing I could add to that, Luis, is that by by participating in a larger community, there, there's bound to be diversity, and you will find people that have something in common with your, um, with our understanding of conservation, and at the same time something in common with, to use the example that you just um, brought up, um, the the rancher on the ground 
facing uh, an issue with cows. And perhaps that person with that um, that more diverse and more uh, complete understanding of the issues is not somebody that lives next door, but by expanding the vision to to the whole pilot area, there might be somebody out there that joins the cooperative and can, and can serve as a as a better bridge than than anyone local. So let's go ahead and oh, did, does Larry still have his hand up? Did you have a question, Larry, or is that from before? I think that's a technical glitch. I'll turn it off. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and talk about next steps and opportunities for engagement. I, I think um, some of what we're talking about, you know, will come out a little more as we talk through what's coming up for everyone um, over the next year in terms of how we're going to proceed. So I think most people um, who've been involved a little along the way have seen this diagram at some point. Um, just outlining how we're moving through over a number of years here. So the part that's sprayed out was where we started last year and before that, and I talked about that at the beginning of this webinar. And we're really in this highlighted area now where we're moving into pilot area specific work, um, working with this pilot area guiding team, you know, getting this understanding of what's going on in the region to, to move through this climate smart conservation cycle. Um, and I have it in Espanol. Um, we'll be finalizing these and sharing back with participants just so everyone knows that's coming. So um, over the next few months, uh, where we're headed is to do a lot of work to get us to some pilot area workshops in the fall of this year. And so uh, part of that work involves continuing to integrate pilot area guiding teams and partners into this conservation design development like we're doing today with folks bringing up good points. Um, and then working with pilot area partners uh, to identify conservation priorities, available data, uh, values and capacities. And this values piece might get to some of these questions um, people have raised about uh, stakeholders in the region and their issues that they're dealing with. Um, and then really importantly, um, identifying focal conservation targets for pilot areas to be using at the fall workshop. So this doesn't maybe sound like a lot, it's just these two bullet points, but it's a lot of work around in the next few months around um, data discovery and spatial product development to really get us to an informed place for these fall workshops where um, we have some interim products, um, we have some working scenarios, we have a good lay of the land of what people are working on and where they are, um, where they are um, potentially going in the next five to ten years to help us understand where um, this work can really integrate. And so this is a uh, Again, a little overview. I know these words are, are tiny. Don't worry about them. I'm covering them in other slides. But just so you can see the flow of how this is, is working through um, over the rest of this year. And then you'll just note here that, you know, the idea is to really um, get some interim products, work with them at this first pilot area workshop, and then sometime next year in 2017, advance pieces with another workshop and with lots of um, analysis, modeling, um, and, and uh, conservation design core team work in between to produce some good products. So um, just to talk a little more about these fall workshops, um, really, we're really looking to hone in again on, on refining these shared resource goals, conservation objectives, and targets. Um, sharing back with all of you what is already happening and been developed through previous work. So this is really important um, how we synthesize that and share it back with all of you through workshops to make good decisions and good, do really uh, effective adaptation planning. Um, we'll be working with some draft scenarios, working with the Southwest Climate Science Center. And coming out of this workshop, we want to be identifying um, big spatial analysis modeling needs and science gaps to, to be working on in the interim 
Um, and really importantly, part of this conservation design process is getting at this resource vulnerability issue. So we'll be doing some pre-work uh, to, to set up some framework around how we identify key vulnerabilities and then working at these workshops to really um, work through those vulnerabilities and start to think about potential adaptation strategies or evaluate existing strategies people are using and get to some short-term actions that people can be working on um, or are already working on and maybe need to refine a little. And so that's a lot of um, information. I'll just pause for a minute and see if, um, I don't think I have a question slide here, but I'm not seeing any hands up, so. Um, Check. Okay. So we'll we'll um, move along, and, and if you have questions that pop up, we can spend some time at the end. So I want to talk. Well, I think I will pass this um, to Tani to talk just a little bit about how how does this look for you all trying to plug into the pilot area team and um, and how the team is integrating with the um, existing LTC working groups and science um, and management question teams and Tani, take us away. Okay, so this is a little busy slide, um, but it's all in one. So basically the center triangle with the star is our core team. Uh, the guiding team is the, the um, Juan Carlos and Sergio and Peter and others of you who are going to want to get more involved, and that is open to those of you who do want to get more involved and would be more involved uh, more like uh, more frequently. This larger LCPD team is basically all of you who want to be involved in some way in coming to the workshops. Um, anybody who's interested is part of that. And then we have on the left these purple circles, we want to involve teams from existing place-based collaboratives. Um, Las Cienegas, Altar Valley, San Pedro, there's a number, Gila Watershed Partnership, um, another, a number existing collaboratives where a lot of, is already happening and we want to build on that. On the lower diamonds are all the other organizations and agencies that would be participating and on the right side are more of the science and technical uh, teams uh, that also integrate the relevant CMQ critical management question uh, teams of the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative, so um, as well as the science working group for the Desert LCC. So those are going to, we have ideas for what those would be focusing on, for example, the three resource areas, priority resource areas, but those will be, um, thought, you know, uh, more developed as we move forward. Um, on the left-hand side is basically just a, a little bit more detail to explain what those groups are doing and how this is to show how everything is interconnected because we want people to be able to plug in where they are best suited and most interested and not everybody needs to be involved in every, every piece of this. So I think we're going to be making this available, um, all of these slides so that you can kind of consider it more mm -hmm. carefully when you can read it better. Louise, is there anything else to note about this? Yeah, I'll just add that um, the Desert LTC Steering Committee is involved at this level of um, sort of overseeing and guidance, and there will be important decision-making points along the way where they will be involved um, so that we keep a coherent product of conservation design moving forward as well as across the pilot, because there's a learning interest there. Yes. Right. So um, having run you through that quick, quickly, that diagram, um, Colleen is going to pop a link into the chat box, I believe, <laughs> um, so that if you are interested in being uh, involved in a particular way, um, there it is. Uh, you can click on that link and fill out the form. I will also follow up with an email after this webinar to everyone who registered and share this link so that um, you can follow up later if that's better for you. But um, definitely want to start 
understanding how people, various ways that people are wanting to be involved and start um, really integrating that with these existing working groups and um, teams. And so um, the last few slides I have here are just some immediate next steps to have on your radar. So we'll be setting up, we've already been having coordinating calls with um, our, our pilot guiding team leads here, but we want to be getting more regular calls together with the group of uh, folks helping coordinate this pilot area. Um, we'll be looking to put together a webinar, so some initial information sharing from uh, conservation design products back to all of you. So looking at current knowledge and stressors sometime this summer, so stay on the lookout for that. Um, we will be looking to schedule these two-day uh, pilot area workshops in the fall, which we've talked a lot about. I've got the two range of dates that we're working with right now uh, up here so you can see that, and we'll be in touch um, very soon to get those scheduled and on folks' calendars. Um, and then uh, just to put this on your radar as well, we'll be really looking to start moving from this high-level uh, high-level, full LTC context for conservation design down into the pilot areas and start really looking at um, focal conservation targets that we're going to want to focus on in the fall. And so pencil these dates in because we want lots of good participation in the fall and um, we'll definitely be in touch about these various steps starting pretty much next week. <laughs> um, so I think, so that was all I had with slides. So we want to open it up to questions, comments, um, and we have a little time left here. We have about 11 minutes. So do you folks have any questions? Louise, this is Tani. Um, it seems that the hand raising isn't um, showing up very easily. So maybe um, if you have a question, you can just chime in or, or write something in the chat box. Yeah, so you can unmute yourself with star six and speak. Or um, so Noe raised his hand. Everyone's Noe, do you want to go ahead? Everyone's unmuted anyway, so. Oh, okay. So you're not muted. <laughs> so uh, no, Noe, please proceed. Cool. Uh, this is Noe. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool, okay, I just had a quick question. Uh, I was wondering if it would be possible to get a copy of this PowerPoint, would that, would that be okay? Yes, and also this webinar is being recorded and will be up on the uh, YouTube site, but yes. Okay, right, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely want to reference some of the things that you, you presented on later. Sure. Yeah, that's all I had, <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hello? Yeah, hi, this is Brian, Brian Powell, um, and I'm wondering about um, the, the work was done earlier about identification of riparian aquatic resources, grasslands, springs, um, need for threats assessment and monitoring and how that will fit into the framework that you're proposing in terms of conservation target assessment. So some of that work has already been done in this region, so how, how, does, how would that previous work fit in? Yeah, so thanks for asking that. I didn't really go into any detail on that, but um, there was a lot of great initial work um, out of that Tucson workshop primarily where um, we went into quite a bit of depth um, around current adaptation strategies, um, key values in this region, potential other focal Target. So we will be using that as our starting place for sure and adding as, as needed, but that is a really um, good starting place and lots of good work to build on. Louise, I wonder too, um, and Brian, if, if maybe the question is an, a broader one about other efforts um, that have been done to identify conservation targets. Is that correct, Brian? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And there's certainly been a lot of workshops over the years that have identified resources. Now, I realize that those those workshops have been, you know, at different spatial scales and with, with partners from different areas. So I, I recognize the need for, you know, bringing that back out to this new boundary and this new uh, participants. But uh, obviously, Louise is very 
very uh, under, you know, understands what all has been done in the past. So I'm glad to hear that will be brought forward and, and uh, as a good starting place and hopefully that will get us to a place much quicker where we can identify those resources. So that's good. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for reframing that, Amy. Um, we have definitely talked a lot about, um, like, a big part of our time in the next couple months is going to be pulling that stuff together into a meaningful format to use in these small workshops. This, this uh, pilot area in particular has, has done some pretty extensive adaptation planning work. Um, there's been some really good scenario planning work that's already been done, and so we're looking to, to get that stuff pulled together and um, presented at the workshops for sure. Um, Thank you. So, um, let's see, Tim, oops, I'm trying to open it. I see a question from Tim. Um, Oh, yes, Tim, thank you. You sent that before and I overlooked it. Thank you for sending it again. So, uh, Tim asks, has prescribed fire been introduced or considered as a management tool over the area? So, my, in my knowledge of the Madrean, it's very certainly um, an important management tool um, on the U.S. side of the border. I don't know about Mexico, um, maybe Juan Carlos can answer that, but it's definitely a management tool in the toolbox of managers here in the region. Yes, for sure. And I think that uh, this particular case, one of the things we want to explore is how different uh, fire management regimes in the different jurisdictions have resulted in, in uh, different, different impacts to ecosystems and then uh, make sure we provide the opportunity for people to, to share uh, the data and the experiences learned so that we can, we can start better informing future fire management practices that are uh, learned from, from the past experience of all the region and not local places. And certainly in Mexico, it, it's a growing management tool. Uh, but again, there are, there are many other things going on. Fire suppression in Mexico has been a lot uh, less intense and so the whole fire landscape looks uh, significantly different in most of Mexico. Okay, and I see a note from Tice. Um, oh, let's see. Ah, yes. Tim also says use, there is also the use of fire for elimination of invasive species. Yes, certainly. Um, Tice says it would be helpful to know who or what the subset of working groups are going to be or if there will be input about that. So I will just pop back to this um, slide back here with the diagram. Um, let me move this box so you can see it. Or maybe I'll close this. Um, so I think I don't, Tice, I don't know if you have a, um, a question beyond this, but this is sort of was our vision of the different types of working groups. So topical science support, you know, we're envisioning um, that there's overlap between the existing uh, desert LCC science working group and critical management question teams that are focused on water, grasslands, and um, pressures and stressors and monitoring. And that those folks will be um, either embedded in this topical science support that's within the pilot area or the same people or working with people who are, you know, exclusive to the pilot area but working on these topical and science support teams. Um, I don't know if that gets at your question. We'll certainly be keeping folks in the loop as we start convening um, calls and meetings and that kind of thing. And also, it would be great if you're able to fill out um, that form that Colleen pasted a link for in the chat box to give us a sense of how you might like to plug in. Um, okay. Yeah, this ties. The, the conversation that just started to thread on fire is a case in point. Uh, as you well know, there are some really developed working groups and plans around fire for this region that should be pulled together. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Let's see. We had a hand raised from Ashwin, I think. Did I see Ashwin raise his hand? Or was it Akanksha? Sorry. Akanksha, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I did. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I want to know, is there an interest in uh, for the LCPD team in looking at uh, barriers to implementing restoration practices in riparian and aquatic systems in the region? Are you, you're asking if the core team is, thinks and the pilot area coordinators think there's value in that? I mean, I just, yeah, I would like to know if that is something that is valuable to the LCPD team and uh, for this region. So I, I think so. I don't know if Peter or Juan Carlos or Tani, if you have thoughts on that, or, or Amy or Jen. Um, I think obviously riparian areas, sorry, this is Genevieve. Um, riparian areas are one of the priority resources for the LCC as a whole and, and within this area. Um, so that would be some uh, discussion going forward with the team. Yeah, and so Akanksha, we could follow up with you also directly to talk more about that. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so it looks like James has raised his hand again. Hi, uh, James Caligari. Um, <clears throat> I apologize. I can't see everyone's affiliations on the list. Um, and I, when looking at um, Peter's slide with all the, the groups that were represented, I wasn't specifically looking for the water management agencies on both sides of the border. And so I just wanted to see if for instance, Arizona Department of Water Resources, um, Bureau of Reclamation, uh, Conagua in Mexico, IBWC, if those have been engaged. Um, so I, I do not think that the state, Arizona State Water Management Agency has been engaged. I will let Juan Carlos speak to Conagua and IBWC. Definitely VOR is engaged, um, um, given Jen's affiliation and um, other folks involved in this region. Um, Juan Carlos, did you want to speak to the Mexican agencies? Well, I think that uh, Jen and Amy can probably fill in more, but there's, there's certainly been uh, an approach to, with the federal agencies in Mexico City to try and send, get them to send uh, instructions to the regional and local um, offices to, to participate in this process. Unfortunately, that, that uh, invitation for collaboration was not necessarily um, um, <laughs> acted upon swiftly. But I think that as, as soon as we start talking with uh, with uh, state and, and regional managers of Conagua, we'll figure out who wants to participate and, and is not necessarily going to wait until they get the instruction from Mexico City, which could, could take a while, just how Semarnat works and how their, their other priorities. Um, just adding on, um, I would, so I work a lot with Conagua and IBWC, and I would be happy to help make any connections that I can. Yes, please. That's certainly not my area of expertise. So, <laughs> so if you have uh, some ideas, that's great to, to start. And this is Genevieve. Um, I think. We are, as Juan Carlos mentioned, we, we have been in conversations with folks in Mexico City um, as well as with Bureau of Reclamation. Um, we have not been as successful in engaging the state, um, and a lot of that has to do with capacity. Um, 
uh, issues on both sides, but um, one of the benefits of having this group of people together working in this area is to take advantage of those kind of pre-existing relationships and, and being able to maybe find a better way to communicate and better way to engage. So definitely relying on this partnership to um, help bring in those, those really needed partners. So we're at 11, just a few minutes past 11, so I don't want to hold folks. Um, lots of good questions and discussion. Um, stay tuned for more um, information on these upcoming workshops and various steps along the way as we really get rolling with some of these big synthesis and analysis pieces. Um, thank you very much for spending time with us today and for your interest in working with us on this pilot area. And um, Juan Carlos and Peter, did you want to say anything before we close here? I'll just add that um, any participation from our Mexican partners is much welcomed and they can contact me directly on, on what exactly they want to get engaged in and, um, and if I can help in any way to keep them more in the loop. Uh, just let me know. Yes, and feel, feel free to call me uh, for concerns about uh, the, the San Pedro watershed. Um, I, I really see this process as, uh, as being science-based and uh, postponing the political aspects uh, until later in the process. And I'm uh, more than willing to talk about, with anyone, about building this multi-layered and integrated database uh, as the first phase of our efforts. So we'll make this presentation available and um, hope to get your responses on that Google Sheet when we send it out to get a better sense of how you all want to engage. And um, thank you all. I think that's all for now. And we'll see you on the next convening. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.